Okay, um, let's get started. It's my pleasure to introduce in person Jessica Barker from the government, she's our government affairs coordinator and she's going to prepare us all for an effective afternoon with our congressional leaders. Jessica. Thank you. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm pretty new to the foundation. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've been on board about six months and um, I've met a handful of you already and um, it's just a really special group. I'm proud to be a part of it and proud to be working for you. Let's see. Um, I just wanted to start by um, saying a little something about advocacy and how important it is. Uh, it's one of the tools that we can use to influence our government. We're lucky to live in a country where uh, we're encouraged to participate in government and educating our legislators about issues that are important to us um, is a privilege. And I'm glad you're all here to take advantage of that. Um, I'm give a brief overview of the United States government uh, and how the lawmaking process works. The US government is comprised of three branches, so there's a very delicate balance of power. Um, it's pretty genius, the way that it's designed, uh, so no one branch has too much power. We have the legislative branch, which is Congress, which is comprised of the House and Senate. The executive branch, which is the president and the federal administration. And the judicial branch, which is the Supreme Court and the court system. Uh, the legislative branch is responsible for making the laws. The executive branch is responsible for making sure that those laws are followed and that the um, federal government administers the programs that are written into law. And the Supreme Court is responsible for ensuring that the laws are correctly interpreted. So today we're gonna focus on the legislative branch because we'll be visiting Capitol Hill. Congress is comprised of two chambers, the House and the Senate. Uh, the Senate is considered the upper chamber. Um, this is a bicameral legislature which means that uh, the two parts must work together. The House has 435 members, and the congressional districts are based upon population um, as set forth in the US Census. They are elected every two years, so it's a much more dynamic um, chamber. It changes a lot, and uh, they don't have much time to get things done. Uh, the Senate is considered the upper chamber because they do have a little bit more power. Uh, senators are given six years in office, so they actually have some time to get things done. Um, and they are elect, or um, there are 100 members, two for each state. Oh, I'm glad you can read that a little. I was a little worried you wouldn't be able to read it. <laughs> I'm sure you've all seen the schoolhouse rock, how a bill becomes law. I actually tried to put that in my presentation, um, but I'm not that technologically advanced. So um, the way that bills become law is they are first drafted by members of Congress Sometimes they're drafted in one um, of the chambers, either in the House or Senate. And in some cases, they're drafted together from the beginning um, in both the House and Senate. But within, when you see the two columns right here, within each chamber, they have their own process for finalizing the way the bill is written. Um, the bill is introduced by the sponsor it is then taken to committee where they discuss what should be included in the bill and make um, markups on the bill to make sure that it's uh, perfect. During the time it's in committee, they have hearings and markup. Markup is sort of like um, a proofreading editing process. Everyone on the committee gets to take a look and make their changes. 
and the hearings, they bring in outside witnesses um, to give testimony about um, the issues at hand. And we were very lucky to have Mary Hestorfer testify just yesterday at the Appropriations Committee Subcommittee on Defense hearing. Um, they are currently in the process of appropriating uh, funds for the Department of Defense, amongst other um, agencies, and I'll go into this a little bit further later, but um, it was our privilege to have Mary speak about mesothelioma and the need for continued funding through the Department of Defense Congressionally Directed Medical Research Programs, which fund the work that Dr. Krug spoke about earlier this morning. Um, I want to make sure that you see the connection between this morning's presentations uh, and the advocacy process because the funding for the um, research that you heard about this morning uh, comes directly from our advocacy efforts. Um, one of our board members, Ann Abbey, just said to me a few minutes ago that seven years ago when she first became involved, all this funding was not available for mesothelioma research. So. Um, it's not enough, we still need more, and that's why we're advocating today, but it's nice to see some fruits of your labor. Um, and after the bill makes it through committee, um, they go to floor activity where legislators are actually given a chance to debate the bill on the floor and vote. Uh, the final step is conference, where the Senate and the House come together to make sure that their bills are the same. Um, it's very rare that the, um, the bill that one chamber puts through was easily accepted by the other chamber, so there's usually some discussion in conference. The president then signs the bill into law or uses his veto authority. So I mentioned the appropriations process. Each year, the federal budget is determined by the appropriations process. Um, it's a very important process because it determines the priorities for the country. How they decide to appropriate the, fu the money um, really determines what areas they're placing the most focus on. Um, it, and it's really important for us to monitor this process to make sure that they don't forget about our issues as they're appropriating the money. Um, and as I mentioned, the Senate Appropriations Committee, well, both the House and the Senate Appropriations Committee have a subcommittee on defense. Yesterday, Mary testified at the Senate Subcommittee on Defense, which is the body that decides where the funding for the congressionally directed medical research programs um, is appropriated. For the past three years that a budget has been passed in fiscal year eight, nine, and 10, mesothelioma was included as a project of interest, which means there was a pot of money assigned for medical research and eight different disease areas were allowed to compete for this money. Mesothelioma did receive some of the grants, Dr. Krug, um, but it's still a competitive process. There is not a dedicated line of funding. There is not one pot of money that is designated for mesothelioma. And we, that's what we want to change. We want to ensure that there is um, a pot of money that is assigned for mesothelioma and we're not having to compete um, with other disease groups. The current political climate. Um, I'm sure you all watch the news and you know that it's um, a pretty bad economy. Um, and we currently have um, a Republican House of Representatives a Democratic Senate, and a Democratic President. Uh, when we're in this climate, uh, it makes compromise very difficult, and uh, it's hard to get a lot of bills through, bills to become law. In the last Congress, we had 
uh, democratic control in the House, Senate, and the president was a Democrat. That's pretty rare. So we saw some sweeping changes like health reform. Um, it's not often that it happens that way. And again, I've heard, no, you've heard about the bad economy, and that's just even more why it's even more important that we advocate for mesothelioma and medical research funding because money is tight and they're making cuts, and um, we need to make sure that uh, there's sustained funding to NIH and CDC to support the research um, of our researchers. So the facts. Um, one of the points that we really want to make today, because we are interested in the DOD research funding, is that one-third of MISO victims um, were exposed in the military. There's evidence that there was great exposure on Navy ships and in shipyards. And uh, it's important to make that connection. Mary did a great job of making that connection yesterday before the Subcommittee on Defense, um, because that ensures that our placement in the Department of Defense funding is appropriate. There are a lot of legislators right now um, that think medical research shouldn't fall under the Defense Department. Um, so we want to make sure that we make the connection that it, it is appropriate. Uh, there are an estimated 3,000 people diagnosed with mesothelioma each year. And as you all probably know, there's only one currently FDA-approved treatment for meso. Um, Asbestos was used in uh, the Navy ships and shipyards up through the 70s and 80s, and the latency period is 20 to 40 years. So many think that we haven't seen the peak incidence of mesothelioma. We still have 35 million addicts that uh, contain vermiculite, and people are still being exposed every day. Uh, currently, we've had a couple national tragedies that have spread asbestos. September 11th, the Twin Towers were made of asbestos, and uh, also Hurricane Katrina uh, spread asbestos. So what are our issues? I've mentioned uh, medical research funding. We want to see sustained funding for the National Institutes of Health. Um, these are these and every federal agency are looking um, to see budget cuts because money's so tight. So we want to ensure that um, our researchers can keep their labs open. The CDC, which funds Dr. Besich's um, mesothelioma virtual bank, um, we want to ensure that that funding is um, sustained. We heard the good news this morning that he has assurance um, for funding for the five more years. And the Department of Defense, the congressionally directed medical research programs. So, what's happening? When we leave here, we're going to go to a Capitol Hill. And we're having a briefing for Capitol Hill staffers. We've invited uh, members of the House and Senate to send a member of their staff to come and learn about mesothelioma. Um, we're having Mary Hestorfer, who we all know and love, um, give a little MISO 101. And we're also very lucky to have Mike Clements, a patient, talk about his patient experience. So we think it's going to be a very poignant um, briefing and a good learning experience for Hill staffers. Uh, Mary's asked if she can um, say a few words about her presentation as well, um, just so you are prepared for what we're going to talk about. Um, 
which the legislators take to go from the House to Senate side um, do have asbestos, and the tunnel workers um, have been exposed. So yes, that's a, a, something to mention. It, it, it hits home for staffers who walk those tunnels. <laughs> Mary, her story. Um, good morning. So what I just wanted to clarify is that when I'm going to be speaking before these staffers today, I'm going to be speaking more from a statistical point of view. And I want you to understand that the journeys I'm going to speak about may not really relate to you as an individual. Uh, everyone at this table, when you all speak among yourselves, you'll find out that your you know, course of the disease, the treatment, um, you know, how well you've done are very different you know, among everyone in this room. So when I talk about longevity and I talk about survival, I'm going to be painting you know, a picture that based on statistics, not based on what I hope and want to see for the rest of the people in this room. So I just wanted to let you know that some of the stories may be hard for you to hear, and I don't want you to internalize and personalize what I will be saying, but understand the purpose of my talk today will be to get funding and to make them understand and he to hear the voices of those people who are not with us today of the tragedy of this disease and the toll it takes on human life. So again, I want you to go with a lot of hope, and I want you to know that we're all working really hard for you, and sometimes when we speak on this level and, and in this type of a forum, what we have to say is painful for everyone to listen to. So anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Thanks, Mary. Um, so logistically, here's what's going to be happening. Um, Senator Patty Murray has sponsored this briefing for us. Uh, you have to have a, a sponsor on the Hill to give any kind of presentation and use their office space. So she's um, sponsored this room for us. She's been a great champion for mesothelioma. Um, she introduced the um, asbestos ban with mesothelioma research funding attached that was introduced a couple of Congresses ago. And uh, we'll have a member of her staff uh, addressing us as well. Um, the briefing will be about 45 minutes long. We're going to have box lunches. And so you can eat while you're there, and um, we'll be having the Hill staffers come and join us. I will say this a couple of times because I think it's so important because people like me have been giving the incorrect information. We're going to be meeting the buses immediately after this session at the Parkview entrance, which is on the other wing of the hotel outside the blue pre-function room. So, um, just so you know, uh, some of us staffers have been giving you the wrong information. Yes? We actually have three buses leaving, so as soon as we fill one, it will leave. So we'll, uh, immediately after this presentation, we'll walk over there together. Um, Mm -hmm. So we'll end here at 11.15 and we'll all walk over there and hopefully the last bus will leave at 12.15. Yes. We're going all together to the Hart Building and um, having the briefing and from there you'll go to, those of you that are making Hill visits will go to your individual meetings. And I'll go, I'm about to go over um, what you have in your packet. Yeah, I'm about to go over that. There, we have a map for you. Okay, so we are going to be, I wish I had a laser pointer. Um, there's a map in, the, um, in your notebook if you'd like to follow along. We're going to be going to the Hart Building for the briefing, which is in the top right corner. Um, You'll see the Senate buildings, Hart, Dirksen, and Russell, are at the top of the map. The U.S. Capitol building the, is red in the middle. And on the other side of the Capitol, we have the House offices, Rayburn, Longworth, and Cannon. So we'll be, um, the buses will take us to Union Station, where we'll walk over to the Hart building and have the briefing. And um, for those of you making Hill visits, you have on your schedule where your meetings will be, along with the map. 
So let's go over exactly what are in the um, Hill Visit packets. For those of you that signed up to do Hill Visits, you have a blue folder like this that you should have gotten at the registration desk. And if you open that up, the first thing we have is a kind of a how-to for Hill Visits. Um, this tells you exactly the process for making, uh, for um, preparing for and conducting your meeting. Then we have your talking points. These are going to be the points that you should make in your meeting to your legislators. And then I have a one pager. This is just information for your benefit on the congressionally directed medical research programs. And then you have three copies of a what is mesothelioma handout. This is the piece of paper that you'll leave with the staffers after your meeting. On the right side, you have a schedule with your meeting times, locations, and who you're meeting with. Behind that is your map, like the map I just showed. After your Hill meetings, because everyone's coming back at different times, you're responsible for your own transportation back here to the Omni Shoreham Hotel. So we have directions for taking taxi cabs and for using the metro. And please approach any um, of the foundation staff members if you have any questions. What to expect of your meetings? Most of you are meeting with a staff person, unfortunately. Um, Congress, both the House and Senate are in session. So um, it's not easy for the legislators to meet with you. Um, I'm very sorry about that. I was lucky enough to get a couple of people meetings with their actual legislator. So it may be a staff person, and they're probably 22. Um, just yesterday at the hearing, I looked around and thought, oh my gosh, I'm one of the old guys now. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the same age as the staffers anymore. <laughs> um, so, but they are, um, they're the eyes and ears of the legislators. So it, um, it's important to get their um, buy-in as well. Um, expect, uh, oh, meeting space is scarce. Especially a couple of you big delegations, New York and California, you might be meeting in a hallway. Um, the offices are tiny, they're mostly cubicles. Some of the senators have a nicer conference room. Um, a lot of, on the House side, they don't have a lot of space. So um, I've had meetings in stairwells, in hallways. Um, it's to be expected. And it's not a reflection on um, how they feel about you or the importance of the issue at all. Oops. Expect a 10 to 15 minute meeting. Uh, I've heard Hill staffers say that they schedule their days 15 minutes all day long. So if you get the full 15 minutes, it's a victory. Um, and don't just expect a firm commitment, especially if you're speaking to a staffer. Um, the, at the end of the day, the legislator is the decision maker. The staffer is responsible for uh, providing the information. But they can't always give you a firm commitment. They usually will give you their support. What to say. So this is included on the Hill Visit how-to that's in your packet. The most important part is to tell your personal story. That's what people remember, um, and that's what makes the personal connection. Make sure that you focus on the human tragedy of mesothelioma. Um, that's our, the most powerful tool, advocacy tool that we have. Make your ask. Our ask is we want specific funding for mesothelioma research. Um, in the materials, the uh, dollar amount I asked for was $5 million. So a stream that would be dedicated only for mesothelioma research, uh, that's $5 million through the Department of Defense. That would be $5 million annually. Um, take notes. 
I want to know, I'm going to follow up with each and every one of you after the conference to see how your meetings with, went. So take notes. Um, if there's anything, they often will ask you, oh, can you send me this? Uh, uh, could you send me a report on um, the statistics or something like that? Write it down and I can help you gather those materials afterwards and we'll get them to them. Be flexible, they may be late. Um, they, may, they may switch you off to another person. You may go in um, expecting to meet um, John Doe and they're going to have you meet with Joe Schmo. But they're all, um, they're all the same, so they're all there for the same reason. Um, stay positive. Uh, let's go in and um, show them that we have hope, and that's why we're so focused on increasing research funding. Uh, be sure to exchange contact information with the staffer and uh, tell them that you're going to follow up with them. And hold them accountable. Make sure that they ask their boss, uh, what are we doing about MISO? Um, dependent on your relationship to the disease, there are different things you should focus on. Uh, for patients and family members, you should definitely tell your story. Talk about the, if you had difficulty finding treatments or um, getting reimbursed through your health insurance company. Those are important points to make. Uh, and, and the need for better treatment options. Remind them that we only have one, well, they may not know already. Tell them that we only have one FDA-approved treatment, and that's not enough. Uh, if you are bereaved, express the loss of your loved one um, and your commitment to ensuring that others don't suffer the same way. Uh, it's our responsibility to speak for those who aren't here to speak for themselves. Uh, and uh, researchers, Tell about um, your stories of difficulty finding funding. Uh, I already mentioned this, but I'm gonna say it over and over. So our ask, we wanna see a dedicated funding stream of $5 million for mesothelioma through the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program. This is timely. They just had their hearing yesterday. You can tell them a representative of the mesothelioma community testified yesterday before the subcommittee, the Senate Subcommittee on Defense uh, that we need increased funding for mesothelioma and a dedicated stream. It's not enough for us to compete with other diseases. We need to have um, a dedicated funding stream. The message is going to be the same in both the House and the Senate. And what to do when you go home. Include it in your notebook. Um, I've um, included a little handout on 10 things to do advocacy from home. The first thing you do is follow up. Make sure you contact whoever you met with and ask them what they've done with the information you provided and if they um, have garnered the support of their boss. Provide any information that you promised. If they ask you to give them further information about a um, current topic or maybe some current research initiatives, be sure that you send that to them. But advocacy does not end today. Uh, we're going to have Mesothelioma Awareness Day September 26th, thanks to all your hard work, it was um, federally recognized last Congress. A special thing that we're going to be rolling out is the Mesothelioma Ambassador Program. We're going to be giving you opportunities to advocate um, and raise awareness leading up to Mesothelioma Awareness Day and after uh, Mesothelioma Awareness Day. So, um, stay tuned for more information, and I'm here all week, so talk to me about it if you're interested. Uh, on Mesothelioma Awareness Day, we're going to be, members of the community are going to be hosting uh, events all around the country, and also seeking state and local proclamations of Mesothelioma Awareness Day. Now, 
I have left plenty of time for questions. Yes, Rich. Yes. Yes. I will actually suggest we have three states, New York, California, and um, Maryland that have large groups. Um, I ask that you choose one person to be the leader um, of your delegation. Um, perhaps I can put some board members on the spot and um, Hannah, would you mind leading the California delegation? Okay. Okay. And Rich, would you like to uh, sort of be the leader? And I suggest you meet in front of the office five minutes prior to your meeting just to um, Organize yourselves. Make sure you know that one person is responsible for telling, one or more person, people are responsible for telling their stories. Um, one or more per, um, people is responsible for um, making the ask for increased medical research funding. Yes. It passed by unanimous consent um, in both the House and Senate. So it was declared. Yes? Yes, definitely. Thank you. I should have included that in my presentation. Yes, Bob. Yes. Are there other uh, pots of dollars assigned to other diseases? Are we asking for something that no other you know, disease group would ask for? Or, or can we say, look, we've assigned so much of this? Yes. Um, so it, within the Department of Defense, there's a program, the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program, that funds medical research that um, directly affects the military. It's very convoluted. So ask me again. So please ask questions if you don't understand. The Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program is kind of an umbrella. Beneath that umbrella, there are several streams of funding. Some diseases have their own stream, which is what we would like to have a stream for mesothelioma. Breast cancer has its own stream. Prostate cancer has its own stream. Lung cancer has its own stream. Um, I believe multiple sclerosis. There's several diseases that have their own, own stream of funding. And that means they are given $15 million for which breast cancer researchers can all compete for this money. We are in a stream that's kind of a catch-all. Beneath the umbrella of the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Programs, they have the peer-reviewed medical research programs. Mesothelioma has been named a pro program of interest within that peer-reviewed um, medical research program pot. So I'll use the example of 2010 there was a pot of $50 million assigned for the peer-reviewed medical research. Mesothelioma and eight other diseases were assigned as programs of interest, which means that researchers interested in any of those nine disease areas could compete for this money. But if they got better proposals, for um, mesothelioma, mesothelioma could have 
gotten all of the money. We could have had five awards from within that peer review and say um, another program like interstitial cystitis could have gotten none. Yes. Mm -hmm. So do not bring that up. Stay focused on getting this program funded uh, and stay to that point. Mm -hmm. That is our main point. We also support a ban on asbestos. Um, but our, uh, given the time right now, appropriations are being made. So it's the perfect time to ask for increased funding for the Congressionally Medical Research Programs. So that is our focus for today.